Thakur and Burma of Myanmar. So there are sprinkles of cookies also there. And Mizos, Mizo basically no size. Mizos are also of the cookies. They are wandering race. They, in the, they are wandering race. They, in the past, let's say about two, three hundred, four hundred years back, they used to shift from one place to another and then practice zoom cultivation. So that is why their presence is spread in many areas of the Northeast, even in Assam, Nagaland. Then, of course, uh, so, uh, uh, but, but now with the modern system of agriculture coming in and modern life, so they are generally static in one place, at least last 70, 80 years, I don't think they are moving that as much as what they used to. So the art cookie, um, now they are well settled. And uh, this is called cookie chin group. To be more specific, uh, like chins, I think in Myanmar are about, uh, I think, uh, their population is all together about, I think, four million, or I'm not too sure, huh, the, of the uh, population. And in Indian side, we have, uh, you know, Mizoram and Manipur and some in Nagaland and some in Assam area, but in isolated pockets, concentrated in Manipur and Mizoram in particular. So this is collectively known as cookies and sometimes they call it Jo people, mm. you know, Jo people, uh, like that. So it is because of the similarity in the language and culture. Achha. So, but uh, when uh, Manipur merged with India, uh, during the before that, during the time of the British government, the Maitis were also considered as forest tribes. Uh, today, the Cookies are considered as tribes. The Nagas are considered as tribes, but not the Maitis. Why so? This is uh, something that I fail to understand, because uh, firstly, there was nothing like scheduled tribe. Uh, prior to India's, uh, you know, constitution. Scheduled tribe means some tribes were scheduled in the constitution as tribes. Some tribes which remain unscheduled, did not get included, got included later on. And as you know, there are more than, I think, 19, 20 groups still waiting in line to be classified as scheduled tribes. So the Maitis, that time, Possibly, people thought that they are advanced community. You know, they are well-to-do people, and they are uh, they are practicing, you know, very high uh, high caste Hindu Vaishnavite culture. So maybe because of that, some people decided uh, uh, not to give them this. Otherwise, you're right. The Britishers uh, called the Maitis as uh, native tribes. Correct. And uh, recently, well, uh, I think it's been a couple of decades now, they've wanted to be included in the scheduled tribe list. What prevents them from being included in the scheduled tribe list? Uh, firstly, the Maitis themselves, they, they have a very strong pride about themselves. They said that why should we take the help of reservation to be in the places we want to be? We will obtain it without the reservation. When I was the chairman of a public service commission, I interviewed a girl whom I knew that was qualified to be in the OBC list. I said, why didn't you offer OBC list? I didn't say you would have got it, but I knew that she would have definitely got it. She said, sir, I will rather not get the job and then take a reservation. And this is the pride. But, but what, what prevents, prevents this is the Maitis part. Mm -hmm. And before third of May, let me tell you, I think uh, at least 40% of the Maitis would have opposed the ST demand. Is that right? Yes. Yes. They, they opposed, opposed it. Opposed it. For what whatever reason. reason. But, but after third May, people started knowing we need protection. That's the time when people started discussing and the, they felt that some kind of constitutional protection is needed. Plus, there were uh, objections from our tribal brothers of Manipur itself who opposed it. On the fear, everything is about fear. Fear that their reservation and their land will be uh, shared or lost. 
What well, I say that reservations of 31 percent exist, so we can always have, uh, you know, 31 percent for the hill tribes and, you know, like that, you know, some kind of arrangement. Uh, because it's not going to infringe on their, uh, you know, uh, uh, percentage. At best, the material compete outside in India. Mm -hmm. Any Indian, Indian jobs or whatever, you know. So, so there was some fear, and that was the reason for that march on 3rd of May, May which turned violent. violent. It turned violent only in Sarasanpur, not in other parts of the state. Yeah. So, this, this is a very, very complex state. Yeah. You know, it, it has many, many factors in it. it. But, but let me go a little deeper into our conflict that we are seeing right now. Um, Obviously, you, you know, know, there's been opposition to the scheduled tribe inclusion. inclusion. You, you know, know, but uh, uh, to safeguard the rights of our tribal brothers and sisters, there's, there's also the hill councils. Yeah. Why is that not enough for them? Very good question. Uh, actually, as I said, that Article 371C of Indian Constitution, which came into force in 1972, creates the Hill Area, area Committee and also the uh, District Councils. Some, some people feel that this is not adequate for the development of the Hill Areas. The Council and the Hill Area Committee is not adequate. This because they say that is the development has not come. Why the development actually has not come has got other reasons like corruption, governance and other many other factors also. But many people also feel that this is the main reason why it is not working is that this powers of the district council are not adequate. Powers of the Hill Area Committee is not, you know, adequate. That is the reason why what you are saying is that, you know, why this is, why, uh, why is not it, whereas the other interpretation is, at least my, I also have a view, is the Hill Area Committee is a very powerful body and some people are not exercising their powers which are given to them by the Constitution. Sir, uh, is it that uh, they don't know that they have these powers because the Hill uh, Councils have pretty much all the powers that uh, Autonomous District Councils have? Uh, the Autonomous District Councils have powers, but uh, uh, but since our uh, Koki brothers and Naga brothers are feeling that they are inadequate, there must be something about it. So we must look into this, whether they need more power or some kind of restructuring. That is up to the political masters. Of course, sir. I believe that, you know, everybody has to live side by side. All these communities have to live side by side and everybody's grievances must be taken seriously. But having said that, um, uh, there's also been a demand for sick schedule in the state. Um, what are the provisions that that would uh, give the Hill tribes? Historically, when in the Constituent Assembly, we said before making the Indian Constitution, sixth schedule was meant only for the, uh, you know, Greater Assam, which was then existing. Manipur being a kingdom, and nature of the you know, nature of the population, the Constitution, framers of the Constitution and laws, they felt that it may be better for Manipur to have a hill council. District Council under 371C rather than for a six schedule. But the difference is six schedule has got more powers. You know, in Assam has got, I think, five or six. Uh, so, six schedule has got more power. They have got more financial resources. They, get, they can make laws in certain schedule matters, which the district council don't have. In the district council, the boss is the district commissioner. So there are certain structural issues which uh, uh, the uh, uh, people are demanding that these need to be looked into. Let me take this a step further and ask you that we've seen unprecedented violence you know, between, between these, these communities. communities. Um, and we've, we've never, never seen this before. before. You know, we've, we've never seen Maitis and Cookies in conflict. Yes, there's been Cookie and Naga conflict, there's been Cookie and Baipu conflict. But not 
कुकी एंड नाइटी कॉन्फ्लिक्ट एंड द फोर्थ लाइन्स यू नो सम पीपल से दैट यू नो हैव बीन क्रिएटेड बाय इस्टर्न एजेंसीज आल्सो लाइक द इन्फिल्ट्रेशन मैटर वुड यू एग्री विद दिस or would you say it's a multi-layered it is a multi-layered we spoke about the legacy issues they are continuation propagation of all these issues coming out as i said they were dormant under the carpet then people try to exploit by way of you know i you know people talk about the poppy cultivation then people about illegal migrations people talk about uh, other issues of you know um, Uh, encroachment in the forest areas and all this then people talk about majority dominating the minority all this so all this we are building up uh in a very very uh, fast pace actually i would say so i think we fail to see that so infiltration uh, by this is means is it's a reality yeah, yeah, yeah. you know because illegal, i have illegal migration illegal migration because i have heard people say that there is no illegal migration But uh, from what I understand, you're saying is that that is a fact that there is illegal migration. Uh, I just give you. There was a cabinet subcommittee headed by uh, Mr. Hockett, a minister, Hill minister. So they did a kind of an NRC exercise. And within a few days, in January or something, they discovered about 1,400 Myanmaris already inside. Within a matter of, I think, very less days. So people are asking if it was. Uh, if this incident didn't happen on 3rd of may or firstly i think it was stop up abruptly that identification of the illegal migrants but if it had continued people are claiming that there would have been in many many thousands but it was stop after detection of about 2400 i'm not very sure about the figures but approximately so the fact is that they exist they exist so uh, let me come to the solutions some of them not all huh? of, of course of yeah. course sir yeah. you know people who've lived in these lands yeah, yeah. you know yeah, yeah. for generations yeah. cannot be termed yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as uh, migrants yeah. you know uh, but uh, having said that how do you think uh, illegal migration can be stopped because these bor- uh, borders are porous they are highly densely uh, forested uh, will fencing help See, the illegal migration actually is happening all over the world in search of livelihood. In the case of uh, Manipur, there is a push factor from instability in Myanmar, and there is a pull factor of Indian democracy, and then uh, you know the support system that you enjoy as a normal Indian citizen, as a tribe in the hill areas. So there is definitely a pull factor. So we should not uh, just wish away that it doesn't exist. Okay, and your question was that uh, will, uh, border will fencing border happen? fencing? Uh, I heard um, the Home Minister announcing that 10 kilometers has been uh, uh, constructed, the fencing, and uh, 80 kilometers are uh, contract has been given or has been some orders have been. So, but Manipur, uh, b- uh, the border is about i think 362 kilometers if i'm not sure this is quite this but the will the border fencing help it will help in case you have other mechanisms as well surveillance of the fencing physical the way or you know or electronic surveillance or from uh, satellite surveillance because by, by just having a fencing and, and hoping that no one will cross, cross Any, Any obstacle is as strong as its weakest point. point. That is what we believe in. So, if, if you, you just, just make a fence and then leave, leave it as a fence, it's just, just a question of few days. days uh, it will not exist. exist. So, so that is how we, uh, how the border, border, ma- border, border management, management mechanism is put into put into place will dictate what your answer that question. Absolutely, sir. I think I'm on. I agree with you on that. And also the border management force, which is the sun rifles in Indo-Myanmar border, they will have to practically shift into a place where they can dominate by observation those fence, the fence areas in most areas. Otherwise, this will not happen. This will not work. Yeah, it will take. That is one of the reasons why it will be resource-heavy to manage 
this border management in terms of uh, some rifle manpower, in terms of infrastructure like roads and many other uh, infrastructure will have to be put into place. Just by fence alone, we're not doing it. So, so there are so many facets to this conflict, you know, we can talk about the sewer agreements, we can talk about... land rights. But, but as we are limited on time, I'd like, like to come to the part where you can shed some light on what is the way forward. What do you think uh, can we expect, not just from the government but also civil society? The way forward, I'll classify it into short term and the long term. I think in the short term, uh, Home Minister or Honorable Home Minister had announced certain measures, about nine or ten measures, when he came to Imphal, and he announced it on the 1st of June, I think. I thought it was a good beginning, you know, asking people to deposit the weapons, then, you know, uh, opening of highways, relocation of uh, displaced people, okay, and then observation of Sioux agreement by the Koki militant groups, then even calling upon the Maitai CSOs and other groups to calm down. All this, he did the right you know, announcement, what he could at that particular point in time. But the effect was not felt immediately. Now I think this uh, calming down so far, that's good. The first requirement will be to remove these weapons, illegal weapons. Most of it, in thousands, maybe four to five thousands, how does because if you have, have if you have an uh, illegal weapon in your hand, someday somebody is bound to fall due to some enemy team or something, and people will build a narrative, this is the militant, this is that. Any society where such a large number of this is under threat. And mixed into this is the uh, dozens of militant groups who are fighting for what they call as uh, protection of their identity. Some are fighting against the established government and then other anti-social elements, drug dealers, and then anti-social elements. All this comes, so it's a big threat. So that has to be removed first. And uh, the security department of the security forces is being I mean, right now it is, I think, rather well established now, after so many days, has been done in such a manner that this fighting stops. And more importantly, I think the people, uh, there has to be track to uh, kind of an effort by the political people and also by the common people, interested uh, CSOs and uh, the women groups, because they are very powerful in Manipur, women groups. So, this, this is, I'll say, say the, the second, second approach, you know, how to do this. Calming down the, the and, 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 you know, clearly, like, people talk about, you know, uh, some, some like media, this and that, suspicion, that, suspicion about cooperation between some security forces and the militant groups. All, all this fear must be, all these rumors must be set to rest by actually transparent kind of a media management. And, and it, it is, is a time to tell people. people. I have written in an article also, like, like I quoted uh, Mahatma Gandhi's famous quote, eye for an eye makes everybody blind in the world. So, so this will not end. end. This, this is a conflict. conflict. Uh, uh, there, there are no winners. winners. There, there will, will never be winners winner in the ethnic group. So but you mentioned two agreements also. And the amount of weapons that are floating around in Manipur today, over 4,000. Let's say even if... If a thousand have been re surrendered, you know, a thousand have been. Correct. Yeah. Correct. But, but still, the Sioux agreement was based on double locks, one key yeah. with these groups and one key yeah. with uh, our military. Now, how does how does that help the situation? Because if there if there is a situation like this, these organizations may access these weapons again. See, the Sioux agreement was signed in 2008. So, so the, the records, records of cadres, records of the weapon, are of 2008 vintage. What has happened after 2008 till date? 
uh, nobody has you know actually done a, a study on this but i'm sure there will be many thousands of weapons uh, procured after that actually uh, then it is a violation of this way agreement itself you are not supposed to do that but the fact that people are fighting for the last 60 days all over the state of manipur means there are more weapons correct they on both sides correct yeah. correct so uh, let, let me finally come, come to your point of view on how this conflict uh, if it continues will impact india's atis policy as well as india's national security this is a subject that i have been uh, talking about very passionately thinking about it and writing about it as well the chinese myanmar economic corridor cmec is in direct kind of a i want to say competitive uh, as a competitive kind of a approach uh, with our act is policy and myanmar is the battleground they are wanting to get into the bay of bengal and our wanting to get into the asean and even pacific okay so these are almost uh, in the same ground so therefore any kind of instability in the northeast in general and manipur nagaland mizoram in particular in this region will certainly impact very very negatively on the actis policy but i also say that in a geopolitical game there will always be pressures counter pressures and all that but india we as a country have to make sure that our actis policy succeeds by whatever means the state forces and also state mechanism you know must be applied to make sure that such unrest such conflicts are not going to occur if it occurs keep it under some kind of a control uh, you know status so that our indian foreign policy do not you know come to a not for that we need to change our uh, you know act our that neighborhood first policy like myanmar bangladesh they play a very good uh, very big role in all this like you are talking about you know chin you know, you know people, people talking, talking about jailing them you know and, you know the chin, chin group, group of people both on international there's chin national army is part of the pdf fighting the myanmar and then some some groups from manipur of the valley insurgent groups i am told are cooperating with the myanmar army so it's a it's a mess this is going to definitely have a big impact and we have to act as early as possible i'm talking about the india's national security because it has got internal as well as external ramifications so i couldn't agree with you more because myanmar has been a uh his history you know it has been a base historically for insurgents to work against india from you know and bangladesh and china and even at some point of course sir so sir ending on a positive note you know of course you know civil society plays a huge role in bringing peace what do you see happening in manipur in the next few months i think um slowly slowly people are realizing on both the sides that this violence has to end i think so i would agree so from the fear from a state of fear that they were operating now there are many of the people are beginning to think that with this fear of unknown they they started to see the actual fear for which hunger actual fear of unemployment poverty or education of the children and also uh, blocked highways what about the you know aspiration of the young people what is that showing up on ground they were fighting i mean this conflict was fight about the fear of the future but they begin to see the realities on ground that this is perhaps we went wrong somewhere So I think that is and civil society and all mechanisms of the state must uh, try to calm this down. And I'm sure 
that once these um, fears are removed, number one, number two, the aspirations are in a reasonable, put into reasonable kind of a, they say by people, not promising them the moon and delivering something else. So, and also avoiding any kind of a arrangement on ethnic grounds. These are all cocktails of, you know, dangerous, uh, you know, future. So, as long as you do this, I think people will slowly come on. This is my view, but it will take time to heal. For the government structure to be put in place, it will take a lot of time. To gain the trust back into the pre-third May, this will take time. But a beginning can be made now. Sir, that is greatly a positive note that I am very happy to hear. I've held Manipur very close to my heart as I have held all of the Northeast. And for all of us to see peace come back to Manipur, nothing can be greater. And uh, seeing that Manipur is such a Manipur is a such a resilient society, I think they are going to set an example of how you overcome differences. With, with that, that hope, sir, thank you so much for being here and doing this discussion with me. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. As General Himalaya Singh candidly put it, that these wounds will take a long time to heal. But as we see Manipur slowly inching towards normalcy, our hopes are rising to see the wonderful state of Manipur once again inch towards peace and prosperity, not just for the Northeast, but for all of India. Thank you for watching. Until next time.